Harbor of harbors, Bay of Bays. That's what San Francisco Bay has always been to men coming upon it for the first time. Writers, explorers, adventurers alike. It's a bay just made for great times and great ships. It's their story we'll tell today as Discovery visits San Francisco and that harbor of harbors, Bay of Bays. Discovery 67, the award-winning program for young people, with Bill Owen and Virginia Gibson. Hi, welcome to Discovery. And welcome to San Francisco Bay. This is the largest landlocked harbor in the world. 463 miles of basin flooded with salt water. It's 60 miles long and 14 miles wide at the widest part. It's been said that all the navies in the world could anchor in San Francisco Bay at the same time. It's big, all right. But, Bill, it managed to remain one of the best-kept secrets in this part of the world for more than 200 years. It's established fact that there were sailing vessels on California's northern coast as early as 1542. But we don't know for certain whether any European actually saw the bay until 1769. Hard to believe? Not really. Not if you look at a map of the coastline. The entrance to San Francisco Bay has excellent natural camouflage. No matter whether you were sailing north or south, the little opening that's called the Golden Gate is almost completely hidden by the islands in the bay and the hills of the opposite shore, the Contra Costa, a term left over from Spanish California days. It means across the coast or against the coast, and it's part of the disguise the bay wore to keep out strangers. It worked so well that no one really knows who first saw San Francisco Bay. Was it Sir Francis Drake, the skipper of the English vessel, the Golden Hind? Drake was an explorer and adventurer without peer, and he definitely explored this coast in the year 1579. He put up in a bay for nearly six weeks doing repairs on his ship. But was it San Francisco Bay or Drake's Bay, 30 miles to the north and west? If Sir Francis did miss the bay entirely, and if in reality he sailed into Drake's Bay, then the real discoverer was a Spaniard who came along almost 200 years later. His name was Jose Francisco Ortega, and he was a sergeant in the exploration party of Captain Gaspar de Portola. The sergeant was on a hunting party, but what he found made him return two days later with his captain. It was the fourth day of November, 1769, when Sergeant Ortega and Captain de Portola stood gazing at San Francisco Bay. It was a secret no longer. But even after its official discovery, the bay was badly misunderstood. The Spaniards thought the new bay was merely a further extension of the bay they already knew existed under Point Reyes. For their part, the English added to the confusion by quietly assuming that San Francisco was just the Spanish way of writing Sir Francis Drake's name. It didn't occur to them that the bay had been named in honor not of Sir Francis, but of St. Francis, the nature-loving St. Francis of Assisi. Well, who wouldn't be confounded by the grandeur and immensity of this bay? It leads to three other bays and contains 10 islands. It's the only sea outlet for a valley of 60,000 square miles. The waters of 16 rivers flow into it. In itself, it contains two trillion gallons of salt water. And the currents which tear through that water are so treacherous that an island only one mile from a major city was, until recently, considered the world's most secure prison fortress. That's Alcatraz, out there in the main channel of the bay. You can see why they called it the Rock. Alcatraz got its name indirectly from the captain of the first ship ever to actually sail through the Golden Gate. The ship was a San Carlos, and the captain's name was Don Juan Ayala. He named one of the islands he saw Isla de Alcatraz's, Island of Pelicans. But he didn't mean the island we now call Alcatraz. He meant that island, the one we now know as Yerba Buena. Now it's part of a Navy base, the other half being the long, low, man-made treasure island. But before there were Navy men on the island, there were great flocks of pelicans, 
Alcatraces. But that island lost its name, and the famous prison island acquired it by an error made during a British survey of the place in 1826. Alcatraz has always been a barren, forlorn, hopeless sort of place. A lump of rock just inside the Golden Gate. The other islands of the bay are wooded. Angel Island, Yerba Buena, and the rest. But not Alcatraz. Its uses have been as hard as its appearance. It was a fort and a military guardhouse off and on from the days of the Civil War until 1934 when it passed from the hands of the War Department to the Federal Bureau of Prisons and became a super maximum security prison for offenders who'd been hard to handle in other installations. But those days are over. The last prisoners were taken off the island in the spring of 1963. And now the island, like the lonely, homely stepdaughter of the bay, awaits her fate, a fate as yet undecided. She is solitary. Even the lighthouse was automated last year. So for the moment, Alcatraz, the rock, is just a tourist attraction, a point of interest for the passengers of the bay sightseeing cruises, sandwiched in between two massive structures, the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge. San Francisco has many other tourist attractions. Today, visitors marvel at the shining beauty of the city. They ride the cable cars that climb and weave along Powell and Hyde and Bay Streets. They visit Chinatown and Fisherman's Wharf. They eat crab meat and shrimp cocktails without having to leave the sunlit sidewalks. They see Telegraph Hill and are told that Coit Tower is made in the image of a fire hose nozzle because it was donated by a wealthy and eccentric lady whose passion was to chase fires. They remark that the bay resembles the Bay of Naples. What may not strike them is one of the central facts of San Francisco life and history, that a three-way combination made the city what it is today. The first element was the bay itself, a gift of nature. The second was the massive spread of virgin forests which covered so much of the Pacific Northwest, from Northern California through what was to become Washington and Oregon. The credit once more goes to nature. But the third great phase of that creative triple play is man-made. The ships of the California coast are among the most majestic achievements of man in his struggle to live alongside nature and survive, and even prosper. This is the Balclutha. She's a steel-hulled deep water man of the late Victorian period. She's British. But not far from here is a domestic product. She's the C.A. Thayer, built of the lumber of those Pacific coastal forests, designed and intended for the lumber trade. We'll find out about the life of the Thayer and the Balclutha and the ships that followed them in just a minute. The Balclutha was launched in the Glasgow, Scotland shipyards of Charles Canal and Company in the year 1886. By that time, most of the British forests were in danger of exhaustion, and shipbuilders had turned first to iron and then to steel for construction of ship hulls. Steel was lighter and stronger, and therefore more economical. So the Balclutha, being steel-hulled, but fitted out largely with iron detail, is a transitional phase in the history of British shipbuilding. The Balclutha's maiden voyage was around Cape Horn to San Francisco, a trip she was destined to repeat four times during her early years. Her cargo on those voyages consisted of wine and spirits from London, hardware from Antwerp, Belgium, and sometimes coal from Wales. On the way back, it was always the same cargo, California grain, which she unloaded in Plymouth and London. In those days, she saw harbors like New York, Rotterdam, the Havre, and Rangoon. But in May of 1899, she arrived in San Francisco from Calcutta, and word was received from her operators in Scotland that she was up for sale. Her days as a world trader were over. That sale offer was good news to some San Franciscans who owned sawmills on Puget Sound in Washington. They bought the Balclutha, put her under Hawaiian flag, and sent her up to the mills to load for Australia. When she carried lumber, there was cargo everywhere, in the hold, and lashed to the deck where I'm standing. The lumber was piled on the deck until it reached the height of the midship housing, 
right here. In all, the Balclutha was capable of carrying one and a half million board feet of lumber. With a load like that, Bill, she can make a speed of 300 miles per day with a fair and steady wind. She set 25 sails with an average crew of 26 men. Her main mast measures 145 feet from deck level to masthead. The overall length of the ship from the end of the bowsprit to the outward end of the spanker boom is 301 feet. The weight above deck with all sails set is 110 tons. The Balclutha's voyages were long and frequently difficult. Her times in port, waiting for the delivery of cargo, were also long, and they were, or could have been, tedious and frustrating. This is the captain's saloon. At sea, it was the province of the captain. In port, it underwent some radical transformations. The captain's wife took over, and her husband's rough, practical furniture was stowed in the hold, and her own taste asserted itself. After all, she had to have some place to entertain the other captain's wives. With her fine china, crystal, and velvet-covered furniture around, life for a captain's wife, at sea or in port, wasn't so bad after all. What life was like for the captain's wife was one thing. But the sailors aboard the ship, it was something else again. This is what the Balclutha's forecastle looked like in her days as a deep waterman. There are 20 bunks in here, arranged in the space left over from the anchor windlass and the anchor chain. If you'd been a seaman aboard the Balclutha, you'd have lived your life amid oil skins and ditty bags and sea chests. Not all ships had the anchor windlass located in the forecastle. If you were unlucky enough to be a sailor on one that did, you'd say you had a piano in the forecastle. Still, the Balclutha was a luxury hotel compared with the quarters available in another sailing ship, a three-masted schooner that's anchored just a few blocks down the waterfront from the Balclutha's berth. The C.A. Thayer is an American ship built in the United States of American materials to help with the building of American cities. Her hull is made of lumber from the forests of the Pacific Northwest. She was built in 1895, nine years after the construction of the Balclutha. And yet she's made of wood, an earlier method of shipbuilding than iron and steel. Why? Because here in America, the forests had hardly been touched. She was built of wood and built to carry lumber from the Pacific Northwest to the towns that were in need of it, towns all along the Pacific coast. The Thayer is 219 feet long. The launching of the Thayer in the shipbuilding town of Eureka, California, on Humboldt Bay, north of San Francisco, was recorded in the weekly Humboldt Times, July 11, 1895. The first vessel to be built on Humboldt Bay in two years entered the waters from Bendixson Shipyard at 2.09 o'clock yesterday afternoon. The launching of a vessel at one time so common on our bay has become almost a novelty now. And in consequence, a large number of people arrived at the shipyard for the maiden plunge of the handsome vessel. This is what the fair looks like on the inside of the hold. Lots of open space for loading board lengths of lumber from the sawmill. Her hull is made of Douglas fir. She's a typical West Coast schooner of the 1890s. She was built for the job she had to do, and there wasn't much room for anything else. There was even less room here for the men who worked aboard her than there had been in the Balclutha. This area had been used for storing lumber. Then it was converted into a forecastle for the salmon fishing crews who manned the Thayer in her later days. There wasn't as much room on the Thayer for the captain either, or the captain's wife. And yet she came along sometimes, and she brought the little touches of home that showed the hand of a woman aboard so many of the ships of this period. A family photograph, an embroidered sampler, a phonograph with several of her favorite cylinders, and a bit of wildly unseaworthy furniture. Only here on a ship this size, the wife's possessions had to fight an endless conflict over space shared with her husband's ledgers and his logbook. There was one part of the ship that was private territory, staked off for the exclusive use of the captain, his wife and family, and their guests. It was this little afterdeck. If you were part of a captain's seagoing family, 
this would be the only backyard, front yard, playground, and city block that you ever knew. Who were these captains, and where had they come from? For the most part, they were from Europe's northern countries, Norway, Finland, Denmark, and above all, Sweden. There were so many northern Europeans among the ships of the Redwood Coast that the fleet was commonly called California's Scandinavian Navy. There were names like Mortensen, Hendrickson, Hansen, and Christensen. There were so many Olsons, Johnsons, and Carlsons that they had to be kept separate by nicknames like Midnight Olson, Casper Charlie Carlson, and Impossible Charlie Johnson. They had come, many of them, as ordinary seamen on square-rigged deep watermen like the Balclutha, and then jumped ship in order to stay here in America, where the pay was better and the future brighter. At one point, there were 80 barkentines, 300 three- and four-masted schooners, and 500 two-masted schooners on the Pacific coast. Of these, only this one, the C.A. Thayer, remains. What happened? Well, for one thing, a development was coming along that was destined to change the lives of all these men and women and all these ships. We'll find out about that in just a minute. These schooners were designed to sail up the Pacific coast and call on the small villages that served as lumbering ports. A great many of these little ports were located in Mendocino County, California, and the ports came to be known as Mendocino Dog Holes. This is a typical Mendocino dog hole. It's a tiny opening, a nook in the rocky cliffs along the northern California coast. The sailors used to say that there wasn't room for a dog to turn around at one of these ports, much less to get a fully rigged schooner subject to changing winds in through the rocks in safety. Most of the time, there wasn't a pier to tie up at. It was dangerous work. And the toll these dog holes took in ruined ships and lost lives was high. The problems of the Mendocino dog holes dictated the development of another kind of vessel entirely. This is the Wapama, a steam schooner built in 1915. Travelers who were used to the sweeping lines and the white glory of the sailing schooners were a little dismayed at first upon seeing these steamers. They didn't look like much. And frequently the crews didn't either, since it was also their job to load and unload the cargo. And it was impossible to stay clean. If a lady would balk at getting aboard one of the new steam schooners, she might be told by the ticket agent, this is the little boat that will take you out to the big boat. <laughs> or if he were more honest, he might say, just go down to the lumber yard and find a pile that's moving. That'll be your boat. Of course, he'd say that only after he had the ticket money in his hand. <laughs> Of course, there were compensations. Since there were passengers aboard, the steamship companies tried to give them the illusion they were on a pleasure cruise. There was music in the saloon and sometimes dancing, if the sea was calm enough for anyone to feel like it. This particular Nickelodeon features xylophone, mandolin, and piano. An ad for the McCormick Steamers maintains that our rates are the lowest of any transportation line between California, Washington, and Oregon. And it talks in terms of large, comfortable berths and excellent meals. All are modern and up-to-date in every particular and are the safest steamers in the coastwise service. And all are exclusively oil burning, a feature which eliminates all smoke, cinders, and dirt of every description. In time, steam conquered sail. It was faster, more dependable, and safer for shippers and ship owners. That takes care of the passengers, the shippers, the ship owners, and the people who manufactured the steam engines. So was everybody happy? No, not quite everybody. If you were a sailor, and probably the son and grandson of sailors, it wasn't enough to tell you that steam was cheaper and faster. These were men so in love with the sea that they'd endure her hardships year after endless year. Closed and crammed into little cabins like this one. They'd spend their spare time in hobbies that were connected with what else but the seafaring life. They were men to whom the wind in the sailcloth was the air in their own lungs. Lucky for them, some of them, the day of ships under sail wasn't quite over. The C.A. Thayer made her last voyage in 1950. Between the years 1925 and 1950, she made 12 trips to the Bering Sea as a cod fisherman, 
On her final voyage, the Thayer was the last active commercial sailing vessel on the West Coast. She'd once been one of a fleet of nearly 900. When that last voyage was over, the day of the sailing schooner was over too. After all, steam was faster, cheaper, safer, and more dependable. Only, I wonder, Ginny, what would Midnight Olson and Casper Charlie Carlson have thought about it? Maybe it's just as well they'd earned their rest by then. As for the Thayer Bill, she's earned her rest too. An eternity that'll be spent rocking gently on the waters of San Francisco Bay. This harbor of harbors, Bay of Bays. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed today's visit to San Francisco's waterfront. If you'd like to find out more about this historic city and the ships that sailed the coast, then ask your librarian for any of these books. San Francisco by Jean Fritz, Sailors, Whalers, and Steamers by Edith Thatcher Hurd, and this book, San Francisco Bay by John Haskell Campbell. Be with us next week as Discovery continues to discover America. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.